All right. So can you can you see my screen now, Bryce? Yep, it's there, and you sound good. Excellent. Dream not presenting. There it is. Are we good? Good to go. All right, great. So thanks everyone for joining and uh, letting us talk here about jumpstarting your AppSec program. Uh, Jacob and I worked together for a long time at Adobe. Uh, Jacob started out as a developer on the analytics program uh, or the analytics product in Adobe's digital experience BU. Uh, he worked there for years and uh, he started to see some needs in security. And so he uh, started the application security program there. Uh, I joined his team and spun up our SDLC um, and security champions and did a lot of acquisition security there over the years. So we've done a lot of uh, jumpstarting or kickstarting AppSec programs kind of with different cultures and uh, or company cultures and different um, technology stacks and things like that. Um, so what is app security? It is kind of a specialized um, security field. Uh, it can mean a number of different things. Um, it takes different forms at different companies. So you might be threat modeling, pen testing, doing some SAS or DAS things, uh, or even delivering components of the product itself uh, with varying levels of kind of success and engagement. Um, it could be any one of those things or a combination of those things or those things plus plus. Um, these, are, these are kind of the main things that you'll see in the app security space, but the application of these things in your securities culture, as well as um, with your securities or your um, company's needs in mind is really important. Uh, so we've taken a stab at defining it a little bit more broadly. Um, we've defined it here as helping your technology team write defensible code and release trustworthy software. Um, and the way that the reason we've defined it kind of broadly uh, and intentionally vaguely here is because code and app security is kind of now everywhere. It's it's not just on our engineering teams. It's in our infrastructure teams, um, products, um, and uh, people may be writing different internal microservices to solve little problems. And so we're seeing kind of a code explosion or we have seen uh, a code explosion. So we need to have app security in the places where it matters. Uh, so depending on how your company operates and what your company's goals are, uh, you do product security or application security kind of by any means necessary. Uh, and so the way that you approach application security is going to be a really a custom fit depending on how your organization works. Thanks, Julia. So that, that definition is kind of broad, but that's that's on purpose because of that that custom fit that you have to have for your product security uh, program. And the way you start is what what are your goals? Like what risks are you trying to reduce? And these are all like, like classic questions, right? Like where is your sense of data? How's it accessed? What's your attack surface? You know, what does your attacker look like? All those classic questions. Those are super important, foundational to your program. But I'm actually going to say got to go a little bit further and actually talk about your company's goals. You know, what is your company's brand? What does it look like? What brand are you trying to achieve? How does security impact that brand? For example, if you're in the you know, medical industry, um, then maybe your brand's really around this compliance and, and HIPAA and your security program should reflect that and should focus on that and that formality. That's different than if you're a startup that's looking to get acquired, right? If you're starting to get acquired, you might not have a ton of resources, you may not have a lot of money or people, but you still need to tell a compelling story to someone who's looking to acquire you. And so your security program should take that into account, but how are you gonna tell that story? How are you gonna sit down in front of somebody who's looking to acquire you and make a really compelling narrative about, about how you've, you've done security? What about your customers? What do they expect? How do you build trust with them if they're, um, a bank, you know, we've all worked with, or maybe not all of us, but, but some of us have worked with like someone like a bank, they've, uh, they might have like really steep kind of compliance requirements. They want to see a, like a stack of formal papers that show that you're doing security. And if you've worked with someone like this, you, you might realize that a lot of what they ask for doesn't actually help your risk, but it's important to present it to them, right? And it's important that you do it well, because your job is not just to reduce risk, your job is to help your company be successful and achieve its goals. And I think this is super critical. This is why we started here. I think this is so important. You should share this with stakeholders like often and from the very beginning. 
if you sit down with a stakeholder and you tell them like, look, my mission uh, and building out this AppSec program is not just to reduce risk, but actually help the company be successful, help you as a stakeholder be successful. In turn, they're gonna help you achieve uh, your goals. So I would, I would share this message and, and make this like the DNA of your program. All right, so you've started to figure out what your company's trying to achieve and, and trying to figure out like how your customers view you. It's gonna be really easy to fall into the first big pitfall. And that is, I think all of us know, or you'll find out at some point, it's so easy to spend a lot of money on security. And it's just as easy to get hardly any return for that money spent. There are so many tools out there and, there, and there's a lot of great ones. You know, all these scanners and, and aggregators and reporting tools. But if you're not enabling them the right way because you, you haven't done your homework yet, you're just gonna throw a ton of money and get all kinds of interesting glowy dashboards, but you're not actually gonna accomplish your goals. So I would say instead of starting with, with uh, spending money on the tools, which will come, I think you need to instead start with uh, doing your homework, which is effectively getting in their sandbox. Like obviously you need to get in there and you need to understand like where is the technology, where does it sit, what's the technology stack. But I'm talking about more than that. You really need to understand how this, how your product is built. Like how does your company make money with this product? Um, if it's software or whatever it is. And I'm not just saying like, what is the deployment pipeline for your application? I'm talking about like, how is the backlog built and prioritized? How are um, things communicated, right? Where, how does things flow? What are the different people involved? Uh, it's gonna be super critical for you to figure out how to integrate with that. And beyond that, you also need to really understand, you know, your customers and how they expect to interact with your, with, with your product. How do you communicate with your customers? If it comes to um, a breach or a, uh, you know, some sort of report that you have to give out, you need to know ahead of time how you're gonna work with those customers, how you get those messaging out, how they expect to, you know, have a dialogue with your company. And then finally, I'm going to emphasize this again, what are your stakeholders' goals? You'll probably find in any dev organization, there's probably somebody, maybe it's like a VP of product management or something like that, who, who like really is a linchpin for the whole process. Like maybe this person like holds the roadmap or the timeline with, with an iron fist, right? And if you want to get resources, you've got to go through that person. So it's important for you, just as important as, you know, knowing your risks and, you know, getting the details for the latest uh, vulnerabilities, you need to understand how to work with that person. You know, are they driven by data? Um, you need to provide them good options and good, and good reports so they can make smart decisions. Or are they somebody who's more narrative driven and you have to sit down and tell them a story about security and about how it's going to help them accomplish their goals. You have to figure that out because if you don't, these folk can make or break your program. All right, so you figured out what your goals are. You went through the whole system from, from the beginning to the end. You know exactly how the product works. You know exactly how it all flows, all the details. Uh, the next thing you're going to do is figure out how do you measure and define success. Uh, I think we've all been part of a program at some point or something, a project, where we work really, really hard and, and we ship it out. And it's out there and it's doing a bunch of stuff, but we have no idea if it's successful and doing what we want because we never took the time to figure out how to measure success. And this, is, this is very true in security. In fact, I would say in security more than most any other place, you cannot afford to know uh, what success is and how to measure it. So define those metrics, define those KPIs, figure that stuff out. I would also say just as important as making sure you hit the KPI is making sure that you don't over-rotate on it. If you're spending all of your resources on driving something to three nines when two is sufficient, then that's money that you could have spent somewhere else. And so be really judicious about finding just the right measurables and driving towards them. So the next thing, so after you figure out your goals and your KPIs, the next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna figure out how to integrate with your devs. So it's gonna be really tempting, and we've all done this, I certainly have done this. Uh, it's gonna be really tempting to build this beautiful security biosphere it's got all these tools and reports and integrations and logins, and you're gonna to wanna to like go and grab you know, your, that engineering manager by the collar and drag them over to your biosphere, make them log in and view all your beautiful reports. In my experience, this does not work, or at least it's a lot harder to be successful. Because the reality is, is every dev team, product team, 
they have a way that works for them. They have a way to be successful. They have a flow and they have aggressive timelines and they have a lot of pressures. And the last thing they need is to be dragged out of their world and you have to go into yours in order to get their security work done. So you need to figure out like, how do I, if I, if I analyze that CI CD pipeline, how do I get in there to add my automated scanning checks? Or how do I get in there to make sure that my gateways are in place? You know, there's, how do I, how is their backlog prioritized and shaped? How do I make sure that I'm in that scrum of scrum so that I can, you know, inject my stories in there so that, that they'll get done in the right way rather than making them come to me. This is uh, this is super critical. It takes a lot more work up front. It's many times harder to do, but it will pay off dividends in the future. It's been our experience um, at Adobe. So I would say uh, after you've done those things, the next thing comes, and this might be the most important thing on the slide, is establish establish those relationships first, right? So go to all those key stakeholders that you found. Sit down with them, talk about what you're trying to accomplish, how you're gonna help them be successful, what the program's gonna look like, get their feedback so that they have a sense of ownership of this thing, know that you're in it together to make this thing work. I think we've all run into, I know I have, that grumpy program manager that's been doing program management for two decades, you know, worked at Novell before, you know, whatever company's at now, and has done nothing but problems security, nothing but friction. And you know, has this natural inclination to build walls and to separate and push you away. If you go to the very at the very beginning and sit down with, with people like that, some of these important stakeholders, and talk about how you're gonna make them successful and how your thing that you're trying to do is also their thing, they're gonna be they're gonna open up and they're gonna be your, your, your strongest advocates and allies. We found this time and time again in Adobe, where like some of the, the hardest people to to like kind of crack that that outer shell and get them to, to appreciate the security work or the biggest advocates want you to do. So, okay, you've done all that, you've established your relationships, you've got your integration points, you have metrics and goals all lined up. Okay, so now it's finally time to go buy all the fancy tools and scanners and reports and, and processes and, and AI and ML and all the, the fun stuff. So, so now it's time to go. So Julia might be muted. Sorry, muted. Just one second there, Jacob. Uh, one of the things that we need to make sure that we strongly consider when rolling out a program is that uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. We've all heard uh, the best laid plans uh, often go awry. So um, if you're marching in there with the world's best plan, uh, something that you truly believe is gonna change the face of security at your company, uh, it may fall flat if you don't take this into consideration. Uh, there's a lot of reasons that something can fail, but one of the top reasons that I've seen um, is a lack of cultural fit. Uh, not to say the lack of cultural fit of an individual, but the lack of cultural fit of a program inside of the organization uh, that you're trying to introduce. So if you're in an organization that invests heavily in developer productivity uh, and is strongly oriented towards speed of release, uh, and you want to pull everything to a dead stop to do a three-day security review, uh, that's a lack of cultural fit that's not going to be aligned with your company's goals. Uh, similarly, uh, if you're in a risk averse organization that wants everything or that documented formally uh, and sign off at every level, you're going to need to meet that criteria with your program as well. Uh, application or product security has to be a strong cultural fit in your engineering organization uh, because it needs to be an integral part of the engineering program rather than some icing on top. Uh, so, in that organization that I mentioned where developer productivity is paramount, uh, you may be able to find some low overhead, high leverage solution by partnering with the teams that provide that. Um, so, make sure to do an assessment of your engineering culture and find where you can inject secure defaults or good choices that have the biggest impact. Um, and, and a note on building relationships with your tech team. I think a lot of times we think of the tech team as engineers. but uh, in reality, the tech team is so much more than just engineering. Uh, if you want to release software uh, at scale, you often have a team that looks something like engineering and product management and program management and all of these people kind of in their own uh, lanes and realms of influence and, and talents are able to release this uh, important software. So. Um, uh, a lot of times they have different responsibilities. I'm going to talk to an example organization, but I think definitely find out how the engineering team works with the other technology teams to release software. Uh, in my example, uh, we'll talk through some 
kind of prototypical things that I've seen. So uh, engineering is responsible for uh, technical implementation details, technology frameworks, architecture and design. Uh, you might talk to them about how to fix an individual security vulnerability or uh, if they're evaluating a new technology or framework that they want to use, uh, you can add value to that by going and doing some groundwork to find out how that changes the security posture or to recommend kind of the secure choices that they can make with that framework. Uh, but you also want to get to know your product management team because these are the people who set the who know about the business and customer priorities and often set those things. Uh, they kind of create the future state of products and they are the ones who kind of set those long term visions and roadmaps. Uh, and they also have a good idea of the revenue uh, that their products are bringing in, which products are the ones that are um, invested in the most because they're bringing in the most money or which ones are kind of up and coming. And so you can kind of get in early if you get to know the product managers. Uh, you might want to talk to product management about ways that you can help them sell security so that you can get a piece of their roadmap. Or if you're trying to push um, an important security initiative that's going to take a lot of time from engineering, uh, what you want to do with product management is negotiate that space on the roadmap. Um, a lot of times you can get the engineering buy-in of this is the right choice, but product management has to also say this is the right choice to do at this time. Um, one of the things that, that we've been successful in, in or previously been successful in helping with product management is uh, helping to put together um, artifacts for uh, PMs or, or salespeople to uh, point to our security uh, posture so that it helps them sell. And then we can, uh, when they see how that helps the product process go faster, um, we can get a piece of their roadmap to push some of the important security stuff. And then finally, program management. Program management keeps the trains running on time. They're the work uh, execution arm. Uh, they know about deadlines, upcoming current status, and a lot of cross-functional initiatives. Um, if you want a, uh, to introduce a new practice or a new consistent program into uh, your engineering organization, program managers are uh, a good place to start. They're the ones um, who you can talk to about consistently reviewing the vulnerability dashboards that you put together or attempt resolution on things um, and find out from them if those things are getting done. Um, so definitely make sure to work with all uh, different people on your tech team um, and also at all levels. So uh, engineering ICs, you might need to work with them on, like I mentioned, resolving a vulnerability. But if you need to get, if you're trying to fundamentally change the face of, of security at your company, you need to certainly get uh, buy-in from like the VP director level, the people who are uh, making the big business decisions and, and get buy-in from those levels as well. Um, so uh, which stakeholders can help you scale your security program the best? Um, we had some success scaling uh, security at Adobe using security champions. We started with security champions in the engineering organization and uh, security champions has kind of been this buzzword uh, in the security culture circles for a while. Uh, the idea here is that you can recruit people internally to be force multipliers for your security program. It, it works in some security cultures and, and we successfully rolled it out at Adobe. We had uh, appropriate buy-in there. So if you wanna be successful, uh, there's kind of uh, four things that I would recommend uh, for a successful security champions program. And uh, those things are to train your security champions. So there should be a common baseline uh, security understanding amongst the security champions. Um, so make sure that they're technically trained as well as informing them of security's goals and sharing that context with them so that they know what the future is bringing uh, and they can kind of bring that back to their teams as well as bring uh, to you, the security team, what their product goals are and what their pressures are and what's kind of coming down the pipe for them as well. Um, and another important thing that we did was when we uh, designated people as security champions, we uh, went to the top levels and got the buy-in at the top level and had that thing, had uh, VPs and directors kind of nominate security champions on their teams. And so it was something that was a, an initiative or a directive from uh, the engineer's own management team to go and do this thing um, as well, which really helped with uh, making this program uh, take hold. Um, and then also have some immediate wins for getting people on board as security champions, maybe um, have them resolve some security issues or push a security initiative across the finish line. 
uh, we really found that this helped us scale in addition to uh, automating as much as we could around uh, kind of environment discovery and, and reporting as well. Um, and security champions can be uh, an intensive job if it's a, if it's a full-time thing, but another option is if you don't have buy-in or budget for this type of thing, um, see if you can get the budget for like a once a month pizza lunch and learn where you can talk to dev teams about security and become familiar with what they're working on. Um, you've probably seen this if you've been in security for a while, a lot of the stuff that we find out about or, or uh, talk to talk with security or engineering teams about um, is things that like uh, they saw us passing in the hallway and they were like, oh, light bulb went off. I really should have talked to you about this thing. But, uh, you know, now that I'm seeing you, let's bring it up. So make sure your security team is visible. Stuff is moving so quickly in engineering organizations that um, you want to make sure that you are top of mind for them. Um, as much as you can be, because there are a lot of competing priorities going on uh, in engineering. <clears throat> um, great. So at the end of the day, uh, your security program or your AppSec program should be enabling engineering to make their own security decisions. Uh, slide, Jacob, thanks. Um, so we talked about uh, environment observations. So find out what's going on in your environment, where you're working, what's your tech stack, what's uh, coming down the pipe, what are the things that you can observe um, factually about uh, the environment, and then uh, put your security lens on those things. Are those things, are, are those behaviors good? Are they bad? Are they things that we wanna change? Um, and this part, I think I wanna point out here as well, definitely make sure you talk to your stakeholders about this, because. I think we a lot of times come in, um, or, or I've seen myself make the mistake of coming into uh, a conversation saying, uh, the world is on fire, this is a horrible thing, I can't believe it. Um, and the engineering team will say, no, let's, you know, that we do this and this is working as a side because of this reason, or you can't possibly expect us to turn on a dime and fix that thing and here's all of the impacts, right? So, so definitely talk with your stakeholders about um, what it is that they're trying to achieve so you can enable their security um, story as well. Um, and then uh, once you kind of figure out what those things are that need to change, make sure that you plug those things into the existing engineering tools and workflows. As Jacob mentioned, asking someone to step outside of their world to go find out what their security story is, is one of the ways that you're going to hurt the productivity of your organization. So plug into their processes and leverage those. Um, oftentimes they've figured out some pretty efficient ways to work um because they've got to get a lot of work done um and then finally combine those things the security lens and the things you're measuring about the environment and uh the status of those things from the engineering tools and workflows and build out your fact-based uh but opinionated security dashboard so you want to show people where they need to improve but you want that stuff to be immediately actionable so if you're saying you've got um things that are way past due you want to be able to point them to the JIRA ticket or the uh, pull request or the um, issue that you're seeing and how long it's been open and have that thing drive down security risk kind of in an immediate way. Um, another thing about setting KPIs uh, is that, that these things are kind of, they're difficult to do, right? So hard to get it right the first time. Um, don't be afraid to iterate on this stuff. I've definitely had to do that. Uh, several times, uh, I think the first set of vulnerability management KPIs that I tried to roll out were way too aggressive. Um, when I was thinking about it from security point of view, I was like, you know, we should definitely should just fix things as quickly as we possibly find them. Um, but, but, you know, as we kind of mentioned, that might not be the right choice for the company. And if we're constantly interrupting engineering work to fix security issues that could wait till next week or be mitigated short term and then uh, you know fixed in the long term or or things like that then uh, we're not adding the appropriate value to our or to our um, our company and our business so make sure that you're iterating to make sure that that is driving the right behavior and also helping to achieve the business goals of your company <sighs> talking fast all right uh, so your jump started program. So you've done the discovery and met your stakeholders uh, and set your goals and, and rolled this thing out. Um, we've, these are kind of, this is going to be your checklist for how to roll these uh, things out in your application security program. Um, 
but app security programs are a custom fit. We only had a few minutes here to, to kind of talk about how to roll out an application security program. So we gave you a couple examples of the many ways that you can scale a program, but you know, we could chat about this all day, um, how to build that out given I think a company's culture. We do want to make sure that we've got time for questions, but uh, you know, we'd love to chat uh, AppSec, talk, talk shop about this stuff. So feel free to reach out over email and we're happy to chat with you. So Julia, I don't, I don't know if you can see if there's any questions. I'm looking in the chat and I don't see any. So there's a Q&A window. I think someone just threw in a question. Um, yeah. Let's see, it says a little bit off topic. So if you don't want to spend time answering this, I won't be offended. Um, What can I do to better prepare for a career in application security? Is it feasible to find an entry level AppSec job or where should I start? So do you want me to take the, the first crack at that? Sure, yeah, I can, I can add a response too. So I think actually it's a pretty exciting time to be starting in application security. Um, as we all know, security has evolved uh, over the past few decades pretty rapidly. And with the modern day application stack, um, a lot of the investment of a company is in the app itself, right? Because a lot of, you, you get a lot of leverage out of you know, your cloud infrastructure and all these fancy pipelines that you can plug in. There's still a lot of room for, you know, operational security and compliance and things like that. But the, but the space that's growing really fast, in my opinion, is that product security. So first of all, great question. That's exactly a fantastic place to be. Um, if I were you, I think one of the things that makes you can make you uniquely val uh, valuable in this space is if you have a really good understanding of how the dev process works and how software works in addition to security. That blend is is actually kind of rare. A lot of times, people come from all kinds of backgrounds into security, and we, they're not always from an engineering background. So if you can cross those two worlds. Um, I think that's super valuable. So I would spend some time not only understanding the security side, but also understanding the dev side and getting some of your maybe computer science chops uh, in place. Um, after that, there's actually really good uh, programs coming, on, coming online at different schools. Um, but there's also opportunities to go and do things like intern for companies like Adobe um, or just get your feet wet with some of these other things. Um, but more than that, uh, just re reach out to some people, you know, create that network. Um, and in that uh, line, you know, feel free to email me and we can have a, we can have a chat about some of the things I've seen that have successfully started careers in this, in this space. Yeah, I would say plus one, definitely. Uh, I think starting to learn uh, programming and, and computer science, like Jacob was saying, but also uh, there's a lot of really great resources uh, on the internet so that I'm not just repeating Jacob's answer. Uh, OWASP has great uh, resources. There's like the OWASP top 10, but they also just came out with the ASVS, which is a bunch of uh, application security controls. And I think level one of those things, I'm probably saying this all wrong, but they can be automated. Um, so I think, think about uh, those things and what are kind of the common pitfalls that you might have in app security, but also there, yeah, a lot of, lot of resources on the internet, both for proactive or I guess red team-ish and blue team-ish type things, um, offensive, defensive. Um, so learning how to do pen testing, I think is a great way to get into um, kind of application security and seeing how applications can uh, behave and misbehave. Um, but understanding, I think the underlying uh, infrastructure is, is gonna be important too. So computer science as well. I see the questions now, so I can read the, the next one here. Um, so I got a question from Mark. What do you both think about implementing secure defaults in the paved road for dev teams? Uh, so I'll take a first crack at this one. So for, uh, uh, I've seen this be very successful. I think that uh, it again is important that you're able to meet your dev teams where they're at. I think paved roads work where you've got developers kind of all working um, already in a paved road, if that makes sense. If your company invests heavily in developer productivity and has those resources, 
those are definitely places where you should integrate and provide security, secure defaults. And um, I think it's going more and more in that direction and coming out with or uh, coming up with what should an architecture look like, what should security look like, and helping to build those things in from the ground up. I think that's a really successful model, um, but I don't think it probably is going to work at places with a lot of legacy uh, software processes and code and things like that. So the only thing I would add to that is that I, I think that um, approach resonates with developers. I think we're seeing this in other, like self-organized teams is it's another way of like putting together like teams want the ability to have the control to make smart and savvy decisions locally, but they also want like that really easy route <laughs> and they want that security too, right? Not only do they want that in their software stack or in their libraries, but they want that with their security choices too. So I think, um, I think if that's your approach, it's going to resonate with the team and you're going to be successful. Do you want to read the next question, Judith? Sure. Um, do you have recommendations on putting code release gates on CAST to DAST built into the CI CD pipeline? I prefer to gate things before release to prevent vulnerable software changes from going out, but it causes problems with current culture at times. Oh, that's such a good question. That's such like a hot topic too, right? Like, and it like, it like pushes everyone's buttons. So here's the deal. Um, it depends. This is, this is, it's a sad answer, but it's a true one. It depends on your company. Right, so some companies, some teams require a uh, release pipeline that has to be able to get out the door within 15 minutes. And I don't know how robust your scanning is, but that might get in the way of that. So you may have to, instead of having it be a gate, it has to be a parallel operation, that, and then you just have to be really good at rolling back. Um, but for some other teams, like if it's like a hard control, and this is a promise that's been made to customers that you're scanning before release, then you've got to get in there, right? And you've got to have that gate. Um, so I guess the answer is it, it depends on what your company needs. Um, and I think you have to be flexible and I think it has to be in partnership with the dev teams, really figure out if that's the right fit. Certainly if you can get away with it and it's not causing too much friction, then it, it probably adds some value there. Yeah, I, I want to say plus one and I want to say that if you're going to do that, you have to be very careful about those things. Choose the things that should always be true or always be false and test for those things. Definitely don't put uh, something super noisy in there. All right. I think we've answered our questions. Thanks, everyone. It's been great. Thanks, everybody.